welcome to the next in our series of CAM services that we are posting online. Over the last few weeks of the lockdown, and as we look ahead to the continuing lockdown, gardens and parks have, beca have perhaps become even more important for us. They're a means where we can exercise, enjoy the sunshine, and perhaps be creative as we plant plants, mow lawns and tend trees. Even if you don't have a garden, we are fortunate in our city of Dundee that there are lots of parks to enjoy. And indeed, the dog and I were in Caird Park the other day. So it's with that thought in mind of the importance now of gardens and parks that we thought we'd have a short series of studies looking at gardens and parks in the Bible. And today we start with the most famous one of all, the Garden of Eden. But more of that later. But let's start with a quote from Patience Strong. For she said, In a garden green and gay, all my troubles fade away. Sweet contentment here I find, joy of heart and peace of mind. Let's sing together our first hymn. It's about a garden and it's about the beauties of the morning. Morning has broken, like the first morning. sing along with that lovely hymn, Morning Has Broken. Now let's come before God, the gardener, in our prayers. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, source of all things, origin of life itself, we greet you at the dawning of this new day, for you alone are the creator, and you can make all things new. You, creator, are in the business of planting, of bringing new things to life, of sowing seeds that bring fruitfulness and hope, of humanity in harmony with nature, living together in the garden of your delight. But sadly, Lord, this is not how things are in our world. Creation shakes and totters. The world is out of balance. We scream at each other in the cool of the day, and other creatures fear the sound of our footsteps. For we grasped at life and found death. We are not in Eden, and we struggle to find our way back. And yet Eden is not so much a lost garden from an ancient past, as one that beckons us from an emergent future. So in Christ Jesus, the second Adam, you lead us from the wilderness of sin and decay into a new world of hope and God's glory. So forgive us the thorns of our life and transform them into the roses of your love. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment, I'll read to you part, at least, of the account of the Garden of Eden. 
But before we do that, I thought it might be an idea to see the story and to see it in a kind of children's cartoon version that conveys to us the means of how humanity fell. We'll look at the story, of course, in a little more depth later, but let's get the basics of the story first. So let's see what happened in the garden. So part of God's story is about the first time people stopped trusting God. It's called the fall because it's all about how we fell away from God. It begins like this. When God was done creating a perfect world, the first two humans, Adam and Eve, got to live as a family in a beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. They explored wherever they wanted and took walks with God. And God took care of them like a loving father. The Garden of Eden was a perfect home. In fact, Adam and Eve were so free, they didn't even wear clothes. God wanted everybody to be this free, with no shame or embarrassment. Imagine no death, no secrets, no fighting, no fear, no pain, no loneliness, no anger, no bullies, no sadness, no hunger, no getting left out, no crying, nothing bad, ever. This is God's dream for all of us. But part of being free means we get choices. And the first bad choice happened in the Garden of Eden. See, God gave Adam and Eve one rule. Do not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. God knew if Adam and Eve ate this fruit, they would think they knew everything good and didn't need God anymore. They would stop asking God to take care of them. And they would know about evil, which means they would hurt each other. Sickness would come. They would get old and eventually die. God didn't want any of that to happen. So he told them not to eat the fruit. Now, you might be wondering why God would even make a tree like that in the first place. Why give Adam and Eve a chance to know how to ruin the perfect world? But remember how being free means we get to make choices? God wants us to choose to obey because we love him, not because we have to. And for a while, Adam and Eve chose to trust God and obey him. After all, it was perfect in the garden. But one day, an evil serpent decided he wanted to separate Adam and Eve from God. So he came up with a plan to make Eve think God didn't love her. He said, does God really love you? If he does, why won't he let you eat this juicy, delicious fruit? Eve told the serpent what God had told Adam. If they ate the fruit, they would die. The snake told Eve that God was lying. The fruit would only make her smart. Being smart sounded great. So Eve bit into the fruit. It tasted so good, she gave some to Adam. He ate it too. Well, they didn't drop dead on the spot, but things started to change. First, they realized they were naked and felt embarrassed. Before eating the fruit, they only felt happy. Then they heard God coming and ran away. They had never run away from God before. God knew what happened, but he still asked Adam, did you eat the fruit I asked you not to eat? Adam said, Eve made me do it. Eve didn't like being blamed. She said, the serpent made me do it. Really, they had both made a choice to disobey God. God was so sad they chose not to trust him. They had to move away from the beautiful garden. Worse, pain and sadness and death came into the world. It was no longer perfect. This could have been a horrible end to a really sad story. But guess what? It's not. God loved Adam and Eve, and us, so much that he planned a great rescue. Many years later, a rescuer would take the punishment for every bad choice ever made. And because of this rescue, God would one day make the world a perfect home for us again. And that's the story of the fall. So in case you missed it, here's a quick version. God made a perfect world. There was one rule. The serpent tricked Eve. He made her doubt God's love. So Eve broke the rule. Adam broke it too. All the wrong things in the world started. But that's not the end. God really did love them. And all of us. So he began a great rescue plan. And that's a part of God's story. So let's hear the story now in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, and beginning to read at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, 
and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, as God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam, Where are you? And Adam replied, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. Who told you you were naked? God asked. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word to us. Let's sing another hymn now. It's an Easter hymn, This Joyful Easter Tide. So the Lord God banished Adam from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So we read in Genesis chapter 3 verse 23. It was not me. It's all her fault. I wasn't even there when it happened. I'm sure that like me you recognise many of these statements. We probably use them several times in our childhood and maybe even as adults. For the temptation when something goes terribly wrong is always to look for someone or something else to blame. 
we very rarely look to ourselves and the part we have played. We usually point away from ourself to others. That's exactly what happens in today's story, set in the Garden of Eden. Adam, the man, blames the woman. Eve, the woman, blames the serpent. And the serpent, well, I suppose the serpent puts the blame on God. Our first garden in the series is the most wonderful of them all. It was a garden of beauty. Try and imagine the colours and the scents of the flowers. It was a garden of contrast, the shady trees, the running waters from those four great rivers, the animals that played and gambled about, all combined together to make paradise. And it was a garden of produce. There was a great variety of fruit to eat and enjoy. And it was this that caused the problem. For God had allowed Adam and, eat, Adam and Eve to eat any of the fruit trees, except that tree that contained the knowledge of good and evil. But I think we have to ask the question, why? Why did God put such a prohibition in place? Was this fair on his human creatures? Or does it tell us of God's character? In his book, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, Stephen Greenblatt asks the question, what kind of a God would forbid his creatures to know the difference between good and evil? How would it even be possible for those creatures to obey without such knowledge? And what could the threat of death mean to those who'd never experienced death and could not know what it was? God declares that Adam and Eve, the archetype humans, are made in God's image. But how can they be like God if they lack the knowledge God possesses? Is God jealous or perhaps even fearful of God's own creatures? Well, there is actually some suggestion of that in the story itself. Of course, at one level, it is just a nice wee story about a garden, a mythological account of the origins of creation. But even though it's a myth, Myths still convey great truths. And we could look at this story through Adam's eyes, or Eve's eyes, or even the serpent's perspective. But instead this morning I want to focus on God. Was God's reaction to the humans eating the fruit, and note there is no suggestion it was specifically an apple, was God's reaction a bit OTT, over the top? For God expels them from the Garden of Eden, deprives them of their immortal status, and even puts cherubim and a flaming sword in place to prevent their return. We might want to ask, where is the love and mercy and forgiveness of God in this tale? Some suggest that the problem was that the humans weren't ready for the knowledge of good and evil. Others say that God was concerned that Adam and Eve would end up with too much power. But I think the real reason God was angry was not that they took the fruit and disobeyed God's instruction. I think the reason God was angry was because they did not admit their mistake. They found out, they were found out by God and they lied about it. They chose to blame others. And it was that avoidance of responsibility that made God fearful. The human children showed lack of trust in their creator, suspicion enough to fail to own up to an error of judgment. And we have lacked trust in God's mercy and forgiveness ever since. For how often have we chosen to see God as an avenging deity of wrath and destruction rather than a loving father of mercy and forgiveness? Have we come clean with God and asked for pardon? Or have we lied, massaged the truth about what we've said and done, trying to delude God as well as ourselves? 
With power and privilege comes responsibility. Adam and Eve had been given a huge range of, range of gifts and privilege, second only to God. Even the angels were not made in God's image. Remember that. But Adam and Eve were not prepared to exercise their responsibility wisely. The scientist Robert Oppenheimer, who was largely the brains behind the first atomic bomb, famously said after the first test bomb, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer recognised that knowledge must always be accompanied by wisdom. Yes, humanity had the knowledge of atoms, but would they use it for good rather than ill? And so it was with Adam and Eve. They had gained knowledge from the tree, but they were still really children. They lacked wisdom. So yes, it may appear, at least on the surface, that God was rather harsh in expelling them from that wonderful garden. But just think, if they had remained in Eden with that knowledge, what then? Might they have destroyed the entire creation with this knowledge they had gained? And are we not also in danger of using our knowledge to harm rather than aid others in our human family? Bear in mind, too, that in spite of their expulsion, they still bore God's image, albeit now in a mirror, and God promised to be with them on their journey. There is much learning to come out of our current lockdown situation. For example, the CAM team have learned many IT skills. It's been a, an upward curve of learning, actually. And I hope that humanity will also learn something, a lesson from this pandemic, that we are one world. We are not different and competing tribes. What happens in China does impact on us here in Scotland. The events overseas do matter nearer to home. We cannot separate ourselves off from the rest of humanity. God has given this earth garden to enjoy and to share with others. And like Adam and Eve, we need to begin to accept our responsibilities, that with knowledge, there must also be wisdom. We're no longer in the nursery. In Christ, we have become spiritual adults. So let us recognise, let us accept the responsibility that we have to others in our family and our human family who share this wonderful earth garden with us. Amen. Our second reading today is a poem by Mary Gibson and it's entitled Banishment, based on the account in Genesis 3. Speak it in whispers behind your hand. The world is no longer what God planned. That bittersweet fruit has opened our eyes and changed our vision of paradise. It's all over, the secret's out. The game is up without a doubt. We broke the rules and we'll have to pay. Leave this garden forever, today. No good accusing each other. Because what does it matter whose fault it was? For generations we'll take the blame. Our children's children will share our shame. What can we do? What can we say? We had it all and threw it away. Just one final backward glance. What wouldn't we give for a second chance? Banishment by Mary Gibson. Let's sing another hymn now about creation. It's God who made the earth, the air, the sky, the sea. God careth for me.
In our prayer for others this morning, there is an invited response. When I say humble us, you're invited to respond that we might be vessels of your love. Let us pray. The serpent set itself up above all the other creatures as a friend to Eve. Deliver your world, Lord, from the sin of false friends and from those who set themselves up above others. That the leaders and rulers who hold power over millions of lives may always realise that they are accountable to you and to your truth. Deliver your church, Lord, from the sin of pride, from self-righteousness and dogmatism, from empty pious words that bring no comfort to the hungry, the sick or the troubled. Humble us, that we might be vessels of your love. Eve saw the fruit glowing brightly upon the tree, and she took a bite from it. We pray, Lord, for all those who are the victims of the lust for possessions, and those who have fallen into debt or despair. Those who live in hunger or want, because greedy hands have taken what is rightly theirs. And those on the poverty line who struggle to make ends meet. Deliver your church, Lord, from the sin of greed. When we forget all that we own comes from your generous hand. When we hug to ourselves our time, talents and possessions and our love without sharing with others or with you. Humble us, Lord, that we might be vessels of your love. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. Always disorder and chaos. Lord, we pray for those places and people in our world where chaos reigns and jumbled lives prevail. Those weighed down by guilt and burdened by anxiety. Those whose relationships are in life are fractured. Those whose hopes in life are dashed. Those afflicted by the scourge of addiction. Communities where violence, fear and anarchy hold sway. And for all those whose lives have been changed or blighted by the current pandemic. All who feel they have been expelled from Eden's paradise into the despair of the desert wastes. Humble us, Lord, that we might be vessels of your love. And so grant to us and to them, Lord, the faith in sins forgiven, the hope of lives made new, and the love which conquers all things, even death itself. Through Jesus Christ, the second Adam of salvation. Amen. So our final hymn is a hymn really about ecology. Lord, bring the day to pass when forest Rock and hill will attain your destiny. Let's again sing to God's praise.
and so may the gardener who tends us, the shepherd who leads us, and the farmer who feeds us, bless, keep, and protect you, both now and for evermore. Amen. We're going to end our service by hearing one of the most beautiful pieces of music about April. At least I think it's a beautiful piece of music about April. It's all in an April evening. And I thought it was appropriate that we had it this Sunday because by next Sunday we'll be into the month of May and it will be too late. And it reflects on us being the flock of God the Shepherd. Goodbye. Willie will be next with you next Sunday and I'll be back with you in a couple of weeks time. Till then, take care, stay safe and enjoy the sunshine. Yeah.